Hello friends and welcome to Talking with Famous People. My name is Host Eric and I am, in addition to those Talking with Famous People, I am the author of Gospel of the Pantheon. It was a hundred thousand million years ago, things were really slow, nobody else yet to show, place the slabs below and plant them so the plan can start to go. More years into when tears gnashing through Oh holy slaps come into view At last holy result from two into A regal history that demanded you The dread that's ever new It was a hundred thousand million years ago Things were really slow Nobody else yet to show Place the slabs below And plant them so The plan can start to go more years into when tears gnashing through Oh holy slaps come into view At last holy resolve from two into A regal history that demanded you The dread that's ever new It was a hundred thousand million years ago Things were really slow and Nobody else yet to show Welcome back We begin tonight with chapter three The Duchess makes a deal Verse one Two days after the ascension of the Beholder into the Eye in 1718, Entropic Tripocles visited New Hamptonshire, where Campago Relegetti still lived and worked. The god of stumbles and confusion was not there to see Relegetti, however. He was there to see the duke's 16-year-old daughter, the Duchess. Now, Entropic Tripocles is famously fond of lovely young mortals, and certainly the Duchess was lovely, young, and mortal. But on this day, the god came to the duchess because he needed the old woman that only she could become. A woman whose imperiousness, hardened over the course of decades, might rival that of Alienator himself. The god began his midday visit with an uncharacteristic courtesy. Instead of simply appearing before the duchess in her chamber, Entrapped Ripocles appeared out in the stone hallway that he might knock and announce himself. A guard, an errand boy with a sword, really, so it's stationed outside the noblewoman's chamber, but this man seemed to neither see the god nor hear the sound of the god's fist knocking upon the door. Knock, knock. Who is it and what do you want? came the muffled sound of a woman's voice through the door. Duchess, I am the god in Tropotripocles, and I wish to speak with you. Enter, then, she said after a short silence, and let me see you. The god opened the door and stepped into the room. The Duchess saw a very handsome fellow enter her chamber. He wasn't particularly tall, but his eyes and hair were jet black, and he carried himself with an undeniable grace. There was definitely something to this fellow. "'Perhaps you are truly he,' said the Duchess, after she had looked him up and down a few times. "'I am indeed, good lady,' said Interpreter Please, flourishing a small bow. Then something occurred to the Duchess. "'What did you do to my guard?' she asked. "'He ought to have announced you.' No need for concern, replied the deity. He's fine. He simply didn't notice me as all. Well. It's really not his fault. Now, despite her young age, the Duchess was anything but naive, and so, although her instincts said this visitor might well be he who he claimed to be, might be who he claimed to be, she nevertheless tried to maintain some skepticism. It didn't last long. The stranger radiated some force, like ability, perhaps, and the very tangible quality of that energy was enough after a few moments, to settle for her the matter of his authenticity. "'Your char charisma magic won't work on me, God of stumbles in confusion,' said the Duchess. "'I hope you were right about that, Duchess, because this is precisely what has brought me here,' answered the God. The Duchess arched an eyebrow. "'You don't say. Well, get on with it, then. What do you want?' Must we rush into business so quickly, my dear? I think perhaps first some wine is in order, don't you? And before the woman could reply, the god produced a bottle and two glasses. He pointed to the top of the bottle, and the cork popped out and fell to the floor. May I have a seat? asked the god, looking around the room for a chair. The, the duchess's bedchamber also served as her primary office. It was one large room with a balcony. There was a sizable bed against the south wall, south wall and a desk set slightly away from the north. The Duchess currently sat behind this desk, with her back to the wall, for she had been working when the god arrived, and the chair in which she sat was the room's one and only chair. This was not due to any oversight, mind you. The Duchess preferred to force visitors to stand. Unfortunately, the Duchess dealt on this occasion with the god, and she concluded it probably was unwise to make him stand. 
For a moment, though, she had seriously considered doing just that. Very well, sighed the Duchess. Let's move out onto the balcony. It's a pleasant enough day, and there are seats there for the both of us, and a small table for the wine. So the god followed the Duchess outside, and the two situated themselves beneath the shade of the awning, and dropped her please poured the wine, and the Duchess drank. She had never tasted better, but reflexively she gave no indication that she was impressed. Lovely view, remarked in front of Please, Yes, it is, replied the Duchess curtly, and determined to establish the upper hand in whatever exchange was to come, she elected to go on the offensive straight away. They say that wherever you go, high lord, chaos follows. Given that my family has worked hard to establish and maintain order in this dukedom, I am loath to see it undermined. So I must say I am not particularly happy about this surprise visit. Relax, my dear. I did not come here to undermine your authority, answered the god calmly. Quite the contrary. I came here to help you solidify it. And why would you, the god of stumbles and confusion, wish to do that? asked the duchess. Well, it's funny you should mention that unfortunate moniker. Curtis saddled me with that name, you know. I certainly would never have chosen it for myself, as it is most misleading. I am consequently very much misunderstood. The truth is, I wish no ill whatsoever upon mortal kind. In fact, I wish to help mortals, but it is hard for me to do so because people fear me, and after all, I would never wish to force my help upon anybody. Your consideration of our wishes is most gracious, High Lord, said the Duchess. If the god heard the sarcasm, he gave no indication of it. Yes, well, in the sense that grace is the opposite of clumsiness, I guess it is indeed gracious. And given that force is the clumsiest possible way to achieve one's ends, I mean, but you understand that already, Duchess, no? What I understand need not concern you, god, said the woman, but I will say that a ruler, if she is to command the respect of her people, must be willing to use force when necessary. Ah, Perhaps so. I shall defer to your judgment regarding the politics of mortals, Duchess. You do have first-hand experience in such matters. And Fripcherpocles drank his wine, and the Duchess drank hers. She did not take her eyes off the god while she drank, however. She did not trust him at all. Regardless, the god continued, My point is that I'd like to have an opportunity to work with mortal kind, to, to teach people to better understand and manifest divinity. And that's why I've come to see you. I'd like you to help me do it. I think you have the wrong mortal said the Duchess. I can hardly imagine anything that appeals to me less. The god laughed. You don't mince words, Duchess, I'll give you that, but please hear me out. The Duchess drummed her fingers upon the table and appeared to consider the request. She knew that she couldn't very well refuse the immortal, but she was not about to encourage any presumption on his part. Very well. Speak your mind. That we may be, that we may be done with this. Thank you, milady, said in trouble trip, please. Well, to put it simply, I want you to build my church. I am desirous of a church and clergy. I come to you because I hope to convince you to construct for me the great cathedral of my church here in New Hamptonshire. The Duchess was not at all religious, but she knew that the Curtisarians had a great cathedral, and the baby lady Bayans, she believed, had erected one to their god as well. The god of time had one, too, now that she thought about it, and she knew the cathedrals to be massive structures and significant wells of power. The notion that she would want to build one here in New Hamptonshire was ridiculous. <coughs> the woman set down her glass. This god, she decided, needed a good lambasting, and given that to lambast was among her favorite activities, she launched into it with gusto. Foremost, high lord, such a construction project would not be cheap, began the Duchess. How do you propose we are to pay for such a thing? Second, this church of yours in my dukedom will only weaken the duchy. If the church is to be powerful, then it must have authority over certain things. And if it is to have authority, then such authority that it claims will have to be authority that the duke or the duchess relinquishes. True enough, I suppose, said the god. Third, continued the duchess, why would you speak to me about this? My father is the duke, not I, and while he affords me a great deal of latitude regarding the duchy's business, this is too substantial a matter for me to undertake without his consent, even if I wanted to, which I don't. The fact that you have failed to consider these facts tells me that you are embarrassingly, embarrassingly unprepared even to meet with me to discuss why it is such a bad idea. The Duchess let the last bit sink in for a moment. Then she resumed her litany. Besides, she said, 
The Church of the God of Time, despite our efforts to discourage it, has a hold on the hearts of many of our peasants. My people are stubborn when it comes to matters of faith, and they are unlikely to switch their allegiance to any other god, you least of all. And lastly, even if I could persuade the people to direct their worship towards you, I haven't the slightest interest in doing so. As a finishing touch, the Duchess concluded with her well-practiced and usually very effective cold hard stare. This tactic, like her only one chair strategy, helped keep people deferential. It said, no uppityness will be tolerated. The interpreter of Glee's smiled faintly and met her eyes with his own. Such impetus irritated the Duchess, and she glared even more fiercely at the deity. But on this day, for the first time, the woman discovered the limits of her talents. The Duchess was, indeed, extremely good at intimidating people, but Interpreter Tr- Pocles wasn't people, and he wasn't intimidated. The god just stared right back at her without the slightest sign of discomfort, and eventually the woman could bear the weight of the god's eyes upon her own no longer, and she looked away. When she did, Interpreter Pocles responded, All reasonable points, Duchess, all very reasonable, except the one about you people's piety, of course. The god of time is dead, you see, and his demise has left something of a spiritual vacuum in the world. His flock has already begun to dissipate, and his churches have begun to crumble, for the people no longer feel the resonance of his divinity within their walls. He's dead? asked the Duchess. I don't expect, though, the immortal continued, ignoring the woman's question, that these people will simply lose all interest in divinity. In fact, I'm quite confident they will seek that resonance elsewhere. But how can it be that... Interpreter Police held up his hand to silence the young woman. As for the cost, my dear, this cathedral will eventually pay for itself. When my church has grown large, the cathedral will attract many travelers. And wealth and much business will grow up around it. Your duchy will stand above all its neighbors in status, for it will boast the grand cathedral of a high lord of the pantheon. But, attempted the duchess once more, but interrupted Triple silenced her yet again and continued. Do not think, however that I hope to convince you to assist me on the merits of the idea alone, good lady, for you see, while the death of the god of time has afforded me the chance to to fill the spiritual void of your people, that is not the only thing it has afforded me. I am also able now to offer you something very significant in exchange for your cooperation, something that I imagine would be of immeasurable value to a mortal such as yourself. This got the Duchess's attention, so this time she made no effort to interject. Perhaps she realized she needed to shift gears. It appeared this might be a negotiation worth taking seriously after all. None of this was lost on the immortal, and he took a slow sip of wine and clicked his tongue as if casually appreciating the palate of the wine. Then he unhurriedly considered his words before finally proceeded. Proceeding. How much do you know about the god of time, Duchess? He asked. I mean, do you understand what he did? Well, his purpose, what it was, so to speak. I can't, say I, can't, I can't say I've thought about it much, answered the woman truthfully, but she was not happy about how the conversation had turned. She decided some, some snottiness was in order. Oh, wait, she exclaimed. It had something to do with time, right? And <laughs> 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 quickly is chuckled. This poised and imperious woman was actually only an adolescent, and he was glad to see that she occasionally acted like one. Indeed, that's very insightful, Duchess. He kept time orderly, is the long and short of it. It was because of him that all the places of the world aged at the same speed. He prevented one place from zooming off into the future while another languished in the past. He kept things nice and even all over the world. And now he's dead, right? said the Duchess, intrigued enough by what the god said to put aside her reflex to dismiss, at least for now. So then... Yes... Answer the entropy please. The equilibrium is no longer being maintained. Some places in the world will now age much faster than others, and others will age much slower. Okay, said the Duchess. I will admit you have piqued my P I Q U E D. Piqued my curiosity. God continue. Well, obliged the immortal, this phenomenon will not affect the living. The people and the plants and creatures will live and die just as before. And because lifespans will be unchanged, mortals will have a hard time noticing that anything is different. The god paused and drank. It's a little more complicated, really, but... Interrupted, shrugged and left it at that. But what? 
Well, suffice it to say, the mortals are self-involved creatures, and they choose their metrics accordingly. Toss the last emoticon into the mix, and... Who? Interjected the woman. Oh, sorry. Alienator. The last emoticon is another name for Alienator. Okay, go on. But Entropocles, Entropotropocles was apparently not quite ready to leave this point. Surely you know the history of the arrival of the emoticons and the awakening of the world. It's a very significant event, you know. The Duchess suppressed a sigh. No, I don't, but fine. The last emoticon is alienator. Thanks for clarifying. Now, let's not get sidetracked. Okay, said the god. Let's see, where was I? You were saying something, she reminded him, about how time had changed, but it won't actually affect anybody. No, no, the death of god, the death of the god of time will affect everybody, objected Entropotropocles. But the Duchess was not finished. And before that, you mentioned some sort of incentive that you have thus far failed to elucidate upon. I'm working my way towards it, said the god. These things are all interrelated, you know. So be it, said the duchess, but do try to keep the theology to a minimum. It's painfully dull. I'll try, duchess, said the god. The duchess nodded, and the god resumed his explanation. Uneven time does not operate directly upon the living, that's true, but it impacts the land itself, the dirt and the rocks and the sticks, the non-living and the dead, and more significantly, it therefore impacts culture. Culture is the consequence of the interplay between agents and space. It emerges from the proximity of life to other life, it is tied to the land as well as to the living. So these time issues will be, already are, shaping the cultural arc of each of the various places of the world, which certainly will impact the people who make up those cultures. The woman squinted as if trying to make the god's words come into better focus. Let me be a bit more specific, Duchess, said the god. What does uneven time mean for you? It means that in some places people will develop new ideas and technologies very quickly, while in other places the way of life will remain unchanged for decades or even centuries. Uneven time will resist the influence of traders and travelers. When people bring ideas from a fast land into a slow land, the ideas simply won't catch on or will be dismissed, and mortals won't even notice that it's happening. This, the Duchess understood. It seemed quite odd, but it made sense. Then something occurred to her. But now you've told me of the time effect, so I'll be able to notice it, yes? Seems impossible to me that I wouldn't. I don't really know for sure what the answer to that question is, admitted in Tropocrypticles, but I guess that probably, yes, you will be able to. <laughs> the Duchess nodded. At any rate, shrugged the god, there's one place in the world that is quickest and another that is slowest, because although time is uneven from place to place, it's still static within a given place, you see? Yes, so... Okay, the Duchess said after a second or two. That makes sense. Now, the fastest place in the world is the area where the god of time died. He died in 1700, when he fell from a plateau. And the whole rock formation is already eroding away, and the exact spot where he landed is the single fastest few feet of ground on the planet. That spot of ground is so fast, in fact, that when I went to see the body of the god of time, not four hours after he died, all of his bones had turned to dust. The god reached into his pocket. Except, he said, this one. He held up a sun-bleached vertebrae for the woman to see, then placed the bone on the table between them. I take it that bone has some significance? asked the woman. Yes, but we will get to that. I have one more thing to tell you about uneven time. You understood about the fastest land, yes? Yes, of course. All right, then, said the god. Well, on the other end of the spectrum, naturally, is the slowest land. And that land, my dear, just so happens to be right here, the Dukedom of New Huntingtonshire. The Duchess considered this news. I'm not sure, she said, that it's a distinction I particularly want my duchy to have. Your lack of enthusiasm is understandable, replied the god. But living in the slowest place does potentially give you one big advantage, because the only reason I told you about all that stuff, about uneven time, was so that you could understand what the bone does and why it is the incentive that I earlier mentioned. With this bone, you see, I can tie one mortal to the pace of the land in which she resides. It took a few moments, but the Duchess eventually deduced the implications of what the god had said. 
When she did, she opened her mouth as if to speak, but she made no sound. And just to be sure we understand one another, said the god, let me spell it out for you. If I were to use this bone to tie, say, the Duchess of New Hamptonshire to the land, she would age very slowly indeed. Provided she stays in New Hamptonshire, of course, because this land is the slowest place in the world. What exactly do you mean by very slowly? asked the Duchess, her voice betraying just a hint of the excitement she felt. Well, perhaps this hypothetical Duchess would age but one year for every hundred years she lives, probably even slower than that. I assure you, Duchess, that this place feels very slow. But it will be at least a few more decades before I can be much more specific than that. Uneven time is, after all, new to me, too. The Duchess forced herself to breathe slowly. She would give anything, do anything, to get what the god offered. Build him a church, of course, without a second thought. It was a fantastic deal. But the Duchess steadied her will, will and tried to think of this as she would any other negotiation, and that meant doing whatever she could to hide her enthusiasm from the immortal. That's awfully vague, don't you think? asked the Duchess, after she had counted off five slow breaths. If I were this hypothetical Duchess you're talking about, I'd be very concerned that what is being suggested might bear little resemblance to the actual thing, because what is being asked for is quite specific, is it not? Build a grand cathedral for a high lord of the Pantheon. There's only one design for such a structure, unless Accutron has delivered onto his people a second design that I don't know about. No, you are right, there is only one design for a grand cathedral. And it is therefore easy to say precisely what is required to build one, concluded the Duchess. The expense of such an endeavor would be enormous. It would require gold and resources and labor, each in massive quantities, right? Absolutely, I cannot disagree with that. So, continued the mortal, were this hypothetical duchess to take on such a task, she would know quite clearly what was expected of her, yet she has not afforded a clear picture of what she would get in return. She's offered vague descriptions, like very slowly. I do understand your point, duchess. I sure didn't travel trip, please, but what you... One more thing, deity, interjected the woman. If I were this hypothetical duchess, I'd expect you to present the real duchess a real offer, because only when that happens... Can negotiations begin in earnest? And then the woman leaned back in her chair, set her mouth into a studied frown, and folded her arms upon her chest. And Tropotropically smiled to see such fierceness. Everything that he'd seen so far had confirmed his belief that she was the ideal mortal for his plan, and for that he felt toward her genuine warmth. You are right, Duchess, acknowledged the god. You have not heard any offer. The reason you haven't is that I have not yet established with complete certainty that you are capable of doing what I need you to do. You're concerned I'll be unable to build your cathedral? Asked the woman. No. I'm sure you can build it. But there are risks that come along with, let's say, associating with me. This endeavor will require an occasion of close association, and I need to establish that you have the fortitude to handle the risks. What risks? demanded the Duchess. And what do you mean by association? Am I at risk now, sitting here with you? And Charles Tripp, please, ignored the question. Duchess, do you remember what you said to me when first I arrived today? The Duchess thought back. I believe I said, who are you and what do you want? Well, yes, laughed the god, that's what you said first, but I'm referring to your statement regarding what you called my charisma magic. You told me it would not work on you. Oh, right. And you told me that the reason you came, that was the reason you came. I guess I thought you were just being glib. No, I meant precisely what I said, and I believe that your self-assessment was correct, or correct enough for my purposes at any rate. But before I can make you the offer, I need you to prove it. You should know, however, that if you fail the test, test, you will no longer wish to live. This gave the Duchess pause. She eyed the immortal warily. What sort of, what sort of test is this, God? The charisma you felt, Duchess, is but the slightest trickle of the divinity I contain. No mortal can be exposed to it all and keep her autonomy, for I am the God of the follies of the people, and among mortal kinds more ill-advised follies is faith in leadership. It is a mortal's desire to place his or her will in the hands of another mortal. It manifests as an embrace of charisma, 
in which a person gives away his autonomy and offers adoration to another. Doing so provides a sort of pleasure, the pleasure that a favored pet feels when given praise, for example. That is folly indeed, God, replied the young woman. I have nothing but contempt for such weak-mindedness. It is hardly even useful in an underling. The god shook his head. All mortals, even you, Duchess, have within them some longing to indulge in this folly. That urge is fundamental to mortality, because every mortal begins life wholly dependent. Every mortal at some point desires to return to that state. The noblewoman folded her arms and snorted. I have no such desire within me, God. The test, should you choose to take it, will prove you wrong about that. The test will expose you to as much as oh, one-fourth of what I have within me, and you will succumb to that divinity. The test is not whether you can resist. You cannot. The test is, can you recover your independent will once I have taken the divinity away again? Think what you wish, God, said the noblewoman, but I don't do adoring. I will pass your test. And if you do, I will offer you the deal we have discussed, the bone for my cathedral. Offer it to me now, contingent upon passing the test, countered the Duchess. All right, your distrust is probably wise, though I assure you unnecessary in this case. I want you to pass, because I want to make this deal. I need you to stay young for a long time. Before the Duchess could ask him what he meant by that last part, the god picked up the bone from the table and held it aloft between himself and the Duchess. Duchess, he said, I will make you the following offer. Build me my church, and I will tie you to the land. I will give you the potential to live at least a thousand years, contingent, of course, upon your passing the test. Internally, the woman rubbed her hands together greedily. Externally, however, she appeared perhaps even more dubious than before. Potential? she asked. What do you mean the potential to live a thousand years? The god had assumed that the woman would immediately accept the offer, but it appeared that once again he had underestimated the toughness of this particular mortal, so he sighed and set the bone back on the table. Well, if you get stabbed in the head the day after you complete the cathedral, you will no doubt regret having made the deal. I cannot guarantee you long life, because to live is inherently risky. However, I can promise you that if you don't, if you do die in ten or twenty or even fifty years, you'll look like a dead teenager. The Duchess nodded and tried to think of any catches she might be missing. What guarantees are there that once I'm finished you'll not just kill me and steal the bone back? The God considered this. I don't think there's anything I might say or do that would assuage all doubts regarding this, Duchess, but I'll tell you the truth anyways. The woman nodded for the God to continue. I have never before approached any mortal with any sort of offer like this, and based on what I've seen here today, I think it very unlikely I will ever approach another, even should you decline or fail the test. You are so precisely the right person for what I need done that you are almost certainly the only person who can accomplish it. This bone is meant for you and you alone. Regardless of the outcome today, I never will have need of it again. The Duchess thought about this statement for some time before responding. There are many rulers who might build you a church, God. You clearly have things in mind beyond what you have told me. Perhaps I do, woman, but the offer I present obligates you only to build my church, nothing else. Nevertheless, came the Duchess, what, ha what you have planned clearly involves me in some capacity, so you can tell me at least something regarding it. No. You can't or you won't? I'm not going to. As <laughs> at the god. <laughs> the just drummed her fingers on the table and sheared her bottom lip. What an irritating answer. If I am the only mortal who can do this, then you will have to compensate me accordingly. The just told the god. In addition to the bone, what are you prepared to offer me? I am the only candidate, and therefore I am critical to your plans. Surely you cannot expect me to accept your first offer given the leverage of my position. Duchess, I applaud your efforts and your negotiating skills, but I need offer nothing else. I am not some rival duke that you can befuddle, you know. I've come to you with an offer, and when I go, I will leave having obtained your commitment and having tied you to the land, or I will leave with the bone. Those are the only possible outcomes. The Duchess nodded and rubbed her nose. It had been worth a shot. 
but she had pretty well ran out of ideas. To conclude negotiations, having won not a single meaningful concession from her opponent galled her immensely, though. So she kept thinking, and eventually one last possible approach occurred to her. There's still the matter of my father, God, said the woman. You have not addressed that. You are asking me to commit the resources of this dukedom to your project. But that is not presently my decision to make. What will happen if I accept your offer, only to find that despite a good faith effort on my part, I am unable to persuade my father to honor the agreement I have made. I am immortal and therefore patient. You will be obligated to fulfill your end of the bargain when your father dies or abdicates the throne and not before. And this was quite a concession indeed, thought the Duchess, for her father was still a young man. Hi, Lord and Sharpship, please, you have a deal. I will build your church in accordance with terms we have agreed upon. The god clapped his hands together, feeling rather satisfied himself. Excellent, he said. Then it is time to test. Here's a little step right there at the end of page 63 before verse 2. So this is a rather long chapter because there's a lot of exposition in this chapter. Um, hopefully it was entertaining. It was fun for me to read it. Uh, but, um, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of information has to get conveyed in this chapter and does in the conversation between uh, Interrupter of Cleese and the Duchess. So, anyway, I'm going to play the song and say goodnight. Thanks for watching. Thanks a lot for watching. For those of you who are watching the book, listening to the book, or whatever you want to call it, uh, thank you. I appreciate it. it. You know, it, it, it means more to me than, than the videos that get a lot more views, you know? So, thanks. It was a hundred thousand million years ago Things were really slow Nobody else yet to show Place the slabs below And plant them so The plan can start to go More years into and tears gnashing through Oh holy slabs come into view At last holy result from two into A regal history that demanded you The dread that's ever new it was a hundred thousand million years ago Things were really slow Nobody else yet to show Place the slabs below And plant them so The plan can start to go More years into and tears gnashing through Oh holy slabs come into view At last holy result from two into A regal history that demanded you The dread that's ever new It was a hundred thousand million years ago Slow, nobody else yet to show.